I'm Leslie, and this is Perspective. As the editor of the North Coast Courier, I get to meet so many inspiring and influential people from all walks of life. These people are world changers, and many of them could be your next-door neighbour. This week, I have Justin Foxen with us from the Peace Agency. I'm so interested to find out about the Peace Agency and everything that you stand for. Would you just tell us a little bit about how it started and, and what it actually means? Mm, thanks, Leslie. So, um, as you said in the intro, Kathy and I started the Peace Agency. It's about 11 years now ago that we started it. And my interest was in how we can activate citizens to play a more active role in creating the, the South Africa that we all want to live in. I'd actually just come back from the UK in about 2007 and I was so struck by how negative everybody was. I was so excited to be home. Um, I'd been gone for six years and I was just so excited. Everyone was like, why are you coming home? I'd actually built a little marketing business in the UK and they were just like, why would you do that? So haven't you heard how this country's going to the dogs and it's, we're going the way of Zimbabwe and, 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 and crime and all of these things, you know? And I was just so struck by the fact, as I started to sort of unravel this in my mind, that we were 20 odd years into democracy but we hadn't necessarily made that shift into taking responsibility for this country. I wrote a column for the Mercury for about 10 years called The Flip Side. Yes. And The Flip Side was dedicated to exactly that. It was, if the dominant narrative of the time is, oh, you know, we're the murder capital of the world. Well, is that true? Or are we just peddling this information because it suits our narrative, our political agenda? Whatever, whatever it is, uh, you know. So I would go and research, are we really the murder capital of the world? Is there even such a thing as a murder capital of the world? And if so, what is the murder capital of the world? And it turned out it wasn't South Africa, yeah. you know. Or, you know, statistics around, around orphans and vulnerable children, around abandonment, around sexual violence. All of these things are, are very big, weighty issues that we need facts around. And if we can unearth those facts, we can also start to play a role as citizens in overcoming these difficulties. So that was, I suppose, the initial platform that gave me the opportunity to speak to a broader audience about these issues. Just to go back to your personal story, mm. um, am I correct? You actually didn't plan to have children at all. Yeah. And then you started a baby, like you started a baby home, or yeah, did no. you take over a baby home? It's quite a no. It's crazy. Interesting story how did you end up being the people who are not having children no. to the people running the baby home no it was it was it was it was ridiculous um, and crazy our journey is not typical from a baby home you know generally people who start baby homes have an absolute passion for yeah. babies and children and Kath and I had got married and we decided um, as you say that we were that we weren't I, I blend I blend age because Kath and I married a little bit older. but it wasn't really age it was more like I'm not just not sure if I want children. And you know, we, we were living in, in Umklanga at the time. There was a baby home that was about to close down. And in my journey, I was like, stop crime, say hello. I was writing about citizens doing their bids. Yes. I, you know, I was bombarding myself with all this research around the problems in the country. And then there was this baby home. And I said to Kathy, yes, this is the thing we can do. Yes. We can become like, the baby people, and she was like, well, we've been married for a month, you know, we really want to do this. I was like, we do, this is what we want to do. So that's what I was saying to you before we started, you know, I'm the, the ideas guy, and she's the one who actually has to make it all happen, you know. And, and so we did, and it was, so we, we, we just did it on our property. We converted um, what used to be the domestic uh, living area into an, a beautiful nursery and we took in four babies at a time oh. and but it was it was mad because a you know I mean I know I changed my first nappy on our first baby in our baby home that was the first time I'd ever done anything like that and it, it was just like this complete and we had a caring team on the property and we had volunteers and we're intensely private people yes. we are introverts with that was private. the end of your privacy End of, it was like living in a goldfish bowl, you know. But 
You know, it taught us so much because the hands-on caring of babies wasn't for us. Yes. We did it for four years, and I mean, we do have an amazing. Four years is a, it's quite a. It's a chunk. For people who not. We would never have managed without our team. Really, we had a phenomenal team, phenomenal volunteers, but it started the peace agency, and so what then happened was that we were able to start helping other couples to open baby homes. So whilst it wasn't ours to do the hands-on day-to-day care, um, there are people who just love that. That's right in the slot for them. For Kathy and I, what's right, Kathy is a finance person and an administrator. I love to do the talking and the, the dreaming and even the fundraising I love. I can do all of that stuff. Kathy loves the admin side of it. And, so, and generally, when people do this kind of work, that's the bit they hate. They don't want to do the advocacy work. They don't want to do the paperwork. So we then really set ourselves up as an organization to be the support to other people. And over the years, we've opened five baby homes. And all of those, except our, our Durban North baby home, still comes under the... Um, the umbrella of the peace agency. All of the others have gone on to register their own NGOs. That they're, they're flying. You know, we don't want it necessarily to be owned by the peace agency. You kind of help them get started and then let them fly. Yeah, because they develop their own support base in their local community, whether it's linked to a church or whatever it is. They don't need the peace agency then. Then they're kind of doing it themselves, and they've got community members who are volunteering to help them with their. Funds, funding or their admin or feeding for their babies and that's how it should be and it's back full circle to you know what can we all do to make a difference and that thing is so linked to what I always call you know use what's in your hand you know that that staff that's in your hand use that don't think that you have to go do what we did open a baby home because that's a really kind of big and impressive thing to do but actually we're not baby people you know we are we're administrators and fundraisers and we can do all of that stuff for other people but but do what's in the sweet spot for you um, and what you love to do and what you're talented in doing you know so um, yeah but it was crazy those first those four years I mean the thing you know the thing with running a baby home is that it's as if you've got four or five and these, these babies are sometimes under 24 hours old. You know, they come in and they are newborn, you know. So you've got to treat each as if, so it's the clinic visits and it's registering them and it's, you know, and it would just come at you, you know. Every day there's something, then one gets sick and then they all get sick and then you're all in Addington together, fixing all these babies. I mean, it's madness, you know. But out of that madness, you also went from not adopting to adopting your first child, is that right? So that, yes, that's exactly right. So, so Lolly came to our baby home, she was mm, uh, three months and she was probably our fourth, fourth, fourth baby that came into the baby home. And that was interesting because we had, Kath and I had both fallen in love with different babies, you know, and as you do, especially in the early stages of doing this work. Your first baby, you just fall madly in love with, and then, you know, Kathy wanted to adopt. So. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> this was funny. When we started the baby home, Kathy said, you can start this baby home, but I'm telling you that if these babies aren't adopted within a year, <laughs> you have to adopt them. We're going to, so this is your, and I was like, but we don't want children. Are you mad? So she was very crafty. So that's what started the whole we launched the Adoption Coalition, we launched Adoption 101, we were writing articles, really, you must adopt, these babies need homes, please, please, please adopt. That's what you're going to have, like, the Von Trapp family. You know? <laughs> and, um, and so, so yeah, and, and Lolly, I, I remember it so clearly, Kathy was at the court collecting Lolly. She was actually with my mum, I couldn't go that day. And this was unusual for Kat. She sent me a picture of this child. She said, this is the most beautiful child I've ever seen. And I like looked at this and I thought, oh gosh, this is going to happen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And this child came home. I mean, she was just gorgeous. And she's, she's a real fighter. I mean, she, she crept into our hearts, but they were, actually it wasn't creeping at all. She liked to say, ah. Justin, you mentioned there that you kind of work with anti-racism. 
Mm. And I read one of your blogs where you said that you're a recovering racist. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit of what you mean, mm. what you mean about that. So this was a part of my work and revelation, I guess, around, around the systems that have created who I am. I'm part of a system. Yeah. And in my ramblings and my research and my writing, especially in this area of racism, where it's such a hot potato and it's such a, uh, it gets everybody's blood pressure going, I started to realize that as a white male South African, uh, growing up in the apartheid era, I had been very privileged to be part of a system that benefited white people like myself. I went to uh, you know, a, a very, very good school, um, a private school. I was afforded the opportunity to go to university. I traveled. I had holidays. Um, I went in a car to school um, every morning. And I was given the sorts of opportunities that apartheid didn't, that specifically disallowed to black people. And so the research and the writing is that racism is not an indictment of somebody as a human being. Racism is a system. And that I had been part of this system and I benefited from this system all my life and I still do. I still do. And so to be a recovering racist is something for me, for me personally, that sees that I've been privileged, that sees that other people have necessarily been oppressed and works towards rectifying that inequality. You know, I, I'm not a, um, an overt racist. You know, I think that's part of what we've done. We've gone, oh, if you don't use bad words and, you know, you're, you're kind to, to people of other colors and races, then you're not a racist. Well, th that's not really the case. It means then you're not acting on your prejudice. But if you understand that racism is not a person, it's a system that we are all complicit in, regardless of whether we want to be or not, and I don't want to be, um, then you go, oh, okay, I can see how I can play a role in this. That I'm not a bad person. And so a lot of my consulting work is just helping them to see you're not a bad person. And I mean, I'm assuming with, with most of the P organizations that I work with, or all of them, that, that we can deal quite easily and quickly with overt racism. Overt racism is a criminal, it's a criminal act, and that's to be dealt with in that context. But, but all our systems in a post-colonial, post-apartheid country are rooted in racist white environments. That's how they've been built, a lot of them. Just acknowledge that. Be gentle about it. Don't make people out to be bad people. I'm not a bad person. In fact, I like to think I'm quite a good person. But I'm also, I'm also steeped in a racist country, in a post-apartheid environment that means that I have work to do. And the work is wonderful, because every day you get to learn a different aspect about yourself that reveals itself as the process goes along in your heart and in your mind. Oh, that's where I was privileged. Oh, I can see that now. And I suppose having a black child who's also a, a bit of an um, anti-racist herself, you know, she's on her own journey of, of becoming an advocate, you know, or an activist, you know, going, Dad, why, why are all the white people driving and all the black people are, ta are walking or in taxis? What's the, and go, oh, I'll tell you why, that's the hit the history was, man, and group errors and segregation and oppression and economic racism. Just having the conversations with our kids so that there isn't this constant need to defend ourselves. I'm not a racist, some of my best friends are black, you should see that black people in my church and I get on fire. It's not the point, we missed the point. I completely yeah. missed the point, you know. And we can have beautiful... Co so all my work is really conversation-based. Let's put this on the table. Mm -hmm. Let's have some coffee. Let's talk it through. Yeah? I so. think your, your explanation of it being a system rather than a person is one of the best I've actually heard. Because we, we often... We, you know, I've also personally been having that discussion with myself mm -hmm. and saying, 
Because you know, you'll go to a bride and something will happen and someone will say, you know, I, I just, I need to go to, I need to immigrate. Yeah. Because South Africa is prejudiced against white males. So there's no jobs for white males. And it's not, not me. You know, yeah, it's, sure. um, I deserve X, Y, Z and I worked all, all the, the rhetoric of I work for what I have. Yeah. Um, and I used to say that, mm. you know. Mm. I work for what I've got. I, I, I work hard. I studied at university. I studied at school. I studied, you know, I worked in my jobs. Yeah. And it was this, this process of it kind of coming apart. Yes. That, that rhetoric and saying, actually, no, my parents paid for me to go to that university. You know, regardless of how hard I worked, mm. somebody else's parents didn't have the money to send them to that university. That's right. You know? And if you go right back to age three, my parents had money for Lego. Correct. Where that child's parents didn't. And it's not it's not a privilege that I've earned at all. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I love I love how you put that because it makes so much sense. And I love how you describe a coming apart. Mm-hmm. That's that's the process of recovery for me. When things start to fall apart and we find it hard to justify the inequality in our country any further. Yeah. Even in our area here, you know, it's so evident. So I, I, I often wonder how we didn't see it for so long. But we've got a highway that just divides these two worlds. And generally speaking, it's white on one side and black on the other, you know. Um, but we want to justify that. You know, we want, we want to make... It's uncomfortable. Well, it's very uncomfortable. So we don't want to think like that. And I get that. And we might, we might have to... Step out of comfort zones, you know, have the hard conversations, do the work, reach out beyond what may be comfortable to us so that we can expose ourselves but also put it apart a bit more. Thank you so much for coming to sit and give us really like meaty things to think about. I think the audience will be very challenged and yeah, let's, let's talk about it, let's get the conversation started um, and debate in the comment section, you know, if you feel so. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Justin. And thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully the conversation is started and we can take it from there. Thank you.